Okay, great. Okay, so uh, thanks everyone for coming in. And um, we definitely see uh, quite a lot of people interested in your talk, Will. So I will uh, start <laughs> the introduction. So um, it's my great pleasure for you, uh, for me to introduce to you uh, Will Grafwell. So um, he's currently a, a research scientist at DeepMind in New York University, sorry, in the New York City. Um, his research focus on you know, uh, methods and applications for large scale genetic models. And you also heard that currently he's also working on very interesting probability to science. So uh, more interestingly, he uh, is interested in making um, theoretical and methodological improvements uh, to our current genetic models, which will enable them to be more useful and easy to apply to important problems. So previously, Will uh, did his PhD um, at the University of Toronto uh, with David Duneau and also Richard Azamel. And before that, he did undergrad in MIT. Okay, so today um, he will tell us, well, the original title is what EVNs can do for you and what you can do for EVNs, but maybe today the title is a little bit different, uh, your brain on EVN models. Okay, so yep. back to you, Will. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for having me. Uh, means a lot to be invited, and um, yeah, hopefully, y'all will find this interesting. Um, so yeah, I'll uh, I'll just get into it. Uh, whoops. There we go. Uh, yeah. So the focus of this talk is going to be uh, two of my more recent works on energy-based models. Um, the first will dig into you know a, a large place where we can apply them uh, to, to address some very sort of large and important problems in machine learning. Uh, and then the next will be more into technical details of how we can improve them and make them easier to apply to a wider variety of problems. And so at its core, uh, an energy-based model is a model for a probability distribution, uh, similar to a normalizing flow or a variational autoencoder or GAN. Uh, but energy-based models parameterize the probability distribution in a fundamentally different way than those approaches do. Uh, so we parameterize the distribution using an energy function, which is really just some function that maps from the data to a single unconstrained scalar value. And this represents the unnormalized negative log probability of the distribution that we are trying to model. And so we can see here that you know, we ignore the normalizing constant of this model, unlike things like normalizing flows, for example, uh, but uh, we can see that the normalizing constant can be um, can be derived implicitly from this energy function. So it's not necessary to have a fully normalized model to properly specify this probability distribution. And energy-based models have been very popular um, for uh, quite a long time uh, to model systems in the natural sciences, in physics, chemistry, biology. And this is mainly because of a very strong connection between the energy function and like physical like thermodynamic energy of systems. Uh, like we can find molecules like to live in low energy states, which is, you know, which, which we see as being like a high probability event. Uh, but beyond the natural sciences, energy-based models have been very important to the history of machine learning. Some of the first ever like successful generative models for high dimensional data were energy-based models. Uh, in particular, restricted Balsam machines, uh, which were you know, st widely studied in the 80s, 90s, 2000s, um, most famously by, by guys like Jeff Hinton. Um, <clears throat> and at, uh, restricted Balsam machines are energy-based models over um, sort of an augmented space of visible and hidden units with a very simple energy function. And I think one of the neat things about EBMs is that you can represent a very complex amount of uncertainty using such a simple energy, such a simple form for this energy function, which is particularly interesting to me. And so energy-based models, while they were very popular in the 90s and, and early 2000s, they sort of went out of favor as other types of generative model that were successful were introduced. Uh, particularly things like variational autoencoders, GANs, and normalizing flows. And this is because those models uh, get around many of the difficulties that arise when you do work with unnormalized probability distributions that I'll get into later in this talk. Uh, but over the past few years, a number of advances have been made, which have sort of enabled them to rapidly shoot back into uh, the mainstream. And they've been able now to scale up to large scale images, audio, and a, a biological systems, a lot of very interesting domains. And now they're, I would say, a competitive class of generative models 
along with flows and BAEs. Uh, and as well, diffusion models, which are highly related to energy-based models have become wildly popular in recent years. Yeah, um, <clears throat> so like I said, in this talk, I'm gonna uh, discuss two works. Uh, first is from a few years ago, which is uh, focused on applications of EBMs or ways we can exploit their unique properties to address some problems that other generative models can't. Uh, and then the next work will discuss MCMC sampling in discrete spaces with the goal of enabling us to scale up the types of energy-based models we can apply to discrete data. So the first work I'm gonna talk about is called Your Classifier is Secretly an Energy-Based Model and You Should Treat It Like One. And this was presented at iClear 2020 and it was done with co-authors from the University of Toronto and Google Brain. So I think if you ask people why they work on generative models uh, or people who do work on them, they'll probably give you, uh, you know, a list of reasons. Uh, and, you know, for me, the things that drew me to the space were that they, you know, present a pathway for discovering latent structure that's hidden in high dimensional data. They can easily be trained on unlabeled data, which, you know, is difficult when you're out in the real world and data, you know, labeled data is expensive. Uh, but also very interestingly, uh, learning a generative model or learning a good density model for our, our input data uh, can be used to address many different downstream problems, uh, which are currently addressed by sort of hand-tailored approaches for each individual task. And so generative modeling is sort of a nice umbrella that we can maybe a, a focus on. And then all these other nice properties uh, will kind of come automatically once the generative modeling part is addressed or improved. And so in practice, a lot of progress has been made in the field of generative models over the past few years. Uh, and most of this has been driven, I'd say, by, by, by two separate things. Uh, the first is improvements to likelihood. Uh, and the next is going to be improvements to sort of qualitative measures of sample quality, things like Frechet inception, inception distance, uh, inception score, a lot of the metrics that were kind of developed uh, when GANs were kind of popping up into the scene. And I would say that um, you know, the, the, the results and the progress has been tremendous, but I think within the mainstream gender modeling community, there's been a little bit less of a focus on how we can use these models to address all of these interesting downstream applications that do motivate most of us to work in the space. And so we can think of a couple very important and uh, very important applications of generative models that can be addressed very simply once we have a nice model. So for out of distribution detection, which is the ability for, for a discriminative model to predict when it's being given inputs that are different from its training distribution, this would be very important if we wanted to say, deploy some classifier out into the real world uh, and you know, then be able to make informed decisions on new data. So the way we can address this with a generative model or a likelihood model is we train some P of X model on our data and we evaluate the likelihood of all of the inputs we're given. And we can define some threshold and say, if the likelihood of an input is sufficiently low, probably that's from a different distribution than we trained on. And then we can just reject it or refuse to predict on that. Uh, similarly for building robust models, uh, this means building models that will predict reliably, even if given examples from a slightly different distribution than we trained on, we can also address this with a density model. And we can do this by training a density model. And then when, if we're given some input that may be out of distribution, we can perform some optimization procedure to find some nearby input that has sufficiently high likelihood and then classify this input instead. And this approach uh, currently, I believe, is, is still the state-of-the-art method for adversarial robustness on small-scale data like MNIST. Um, so this is something that's been demonstrated to work in the past. Uh, unfortunately, though, what we find generally is that when we try to apply generative models in this way uh, to applications like this, they tend to not perform very well compared to these sort of hand-tailored methods for each of these tasks. And so for additive distribution detection, one thing we observe commonly is that uh, very often these models assign much higher likelihood to wildly out of distribution examples. Um, and that kind of defeats the whole purpose of what we're trying to do here. And if you look at the state-of-the-art approaches for this task, they're mainly based on repurposing existing parts of discriminative models and performing like statistical tests on their upstream features, for example. 
And for building robust models, uh, like I said, the approach I mentioned works quite well in the small scale, but on even slightly larger scale data, um, the current general generative modeling approaches uh, tend to degrade very quickly and are wildly outperformed by, again, hand-tailored methods for this task, notably uh, adversarial training and randomized smoothing, things like that. And so, you know, natural question would be, you know, why is this the case? Uh, and there's a number of possible explanations. One could be that our current generative models simply are not flexible enough to fit the data that we are interested in, in working on. Uh, and, and they just will not perform well at these tasks until we get them to that level. Uh, but it also could be that, um, so as generative modeling has become its own community and its own field of study, <laughs> the architectures that we use to specify our generative models have diverged notably from the architectures we use to define our discriminative models. And it could just be that these additional restrictions we need to place on our model architectures to make them generative models uh, just perform worse at these discriminative tasks of interest to us. And so even if there is some benefit from using our generative model, uh, that might be lost in the decrease in discriminative performance from these weaker discriminative architectures that we're forced to use. And so it's this issue that, um, that I was interested in exploring. Uh, and I found that energy-based models and their unique properties uh, open up a lot of doors for us to address it. So, <clears throat> um, like I said here, uh, the energy-based models to define them, all we need is this energy function. And it can really be almost any function we want. And because of that, it's incredibly easy for us to incorporate known structure, or we can use a uh, parametric model architecture that we know performs well at the downstream tasks that we care about. Uh, of course, this does come at a cost. Uh, and in general, it's intractable to compute or even estimate the normalizing constant of these models. Uh, and it's also very difficult to draw approximate samples. We need to rely on approximate techniques like uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo. And so <clears throat> to train or do parameter inference in these models, since we can't easily compute likelihoods, we need to uh, be a little bit more clever if we want to train them to say maximize likelihood. And so the most popular approach I'd say throughout time to, to do this is not to compute the likelihood and backpropagate, but to directly approximate the gradient of the likelihood. And we see that while log P of X does not have a nice form, we can write its gradient in a, with a more simple expression uh, as we see here. And we see this involves now uh, sort of the expected difference between the gradient of the energy function evaluated at the data and evaluated at samples from our model. So we see here, this is an expectation over the model distribution. So we could come up with a Monte Carlo estimator for this using uh, you know, a fixed number of samples from our model. Um, <clears throat> and this was the estimator initially proposed to train uh, product of experts models and restricted Bolton machines where MCMC sampling was used to generate these samples. Um, but recent work on larger scale energy-based models uh, has had a lot of success using very simple uh, samplers based on Longevin dynamics, where we generate our samples by recursively applying this update here, which looks like a sort of noisy form of gradient descent. So you are stepping down the energy and then adding in a calibrated amount of Gaussian noise, which is going to encourage exploration of the samples. And so <clears throat> this sort of combination of longevity sampling and deep neural network energy functions is mainly what, is, what you can attribute the recent success and repopularization of energy-based models to. And this has given us great results on image data, uh, also on biological, uh, on, on protein folding, um, a number of different, very interesting and uh, diverse domains. So now with that in mind, we can dig into our approach and the work that we did in this work. So here we focused on architectures for solving classification tasks. Uh, we did this because classification is probably the most common ubiquitous place where machine learning methods are applied in the real world. And the way we do this in the so, sort of post deep learning era is we 
parameterize a model of the conditional distribution P of Y of the labels given X to data. And we do this with some function which maps from our input data to K unconstrained real valued outputs where K is the number of classes. And then we pass these unconstrained outputs through uh, the softmax function. And then this function spits out the parameters of a categorical distribution over our K class labels. But you know, this function that we're gonna use here, this is our function, we can do whatever we want with it. We can define with these outputs, you know, we can define these outputs to mean anything. So we can take a different perspective on this thing and we can just redefine each output here to actually be the unnormalized log probability of the joint distribution between the data example and each uh, in each class label. So what we've done is defined an energy-based model for this joint distribution with the following energy function, where we just index the output of this function by the class label. And then from this perspective, we can very easily sum out the class label uh, to obtain a model for P of X or the unconditional data density. And we see here that this now is also an energy-based model whose energy function is given by the negative log sum exponent of the outputs of this function. So then we can use just basic rules of probability manipulation to compute the classifier or P of Y given X distribution uh, from this current model perspective. And surprisingly or not surprisingly, uh, we find that we recover exactly the standard softmax function that we would normally be using to parameterize this classifier in the first place. So putting this all together um, without changing the architecture that we're gonna use to address this problem, we've found models of the joint distribution between P of X to comma Y, the unconditional data distribution P of X and the classifier distribution. And we obtain these all by applying different, very simple transformations on top of the outputs of the function that we would already be using to address this classification task. And so since we found this joint model hidden within our classifier, we call this approach the hidden gem because everything in machine learning needs a cute name. So now that we've sort of come to this insight, uh, we haven't done anything, right? We've just thought a lot. So we need to figure out how we, how we can act on these insights to change the way we train our models. Uh, and we have a number of different options available to us. So uh, what, we, what we could do is we could optimize the joint distribution using the approximate likelihood gradient approach I described, or we could factorize the probability into log P of X plus log P of Y given X. And we could uh, train the log P of X version using the approximate gradient approach. And we could train the classifier using the standard cross entropy loss. And <clears throat> to figure out what approach might be best, we can think about what are the sources of error that might come, that might you know, appear when we do these things. So I mentioned, we draw our samples with MCMC. And you know, in the limit of in, an infinite, infinite number of steps, these will be exact samples, but we don't have an infinite amount of time. So we need to truncate these to, at some fixed, fixed amount of steps. And this is gonna to lead to non-exact samples, which is gonna to lead to a biased estimate of this expectation here, which is gonna give us a biased estimate of the gradient. I should not in a meeting. Hmm? All right, I'll continue. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> and that's effectively the same as optimizing an objective that is slightly different than the one that we actually are trying to optimize. So when we think about what training uh, with this method will do, we see optimizing the joint will give us a biased uh, biased estimator for uh, everything we're trying to train. But if we factorize the objective in this way, uh, we see that we can use cross entropy here to, in an unbiased way, train our model to be a strong classifier. And then in a slightly biased way, we can add in the generative modeling component. And this is important because, you know, downstream, what we, what we, what we really care about here are these downstream tasks that involve this classifier distribution. Uh, so, for that reason, we decided to go with this factorization of the objective. Uh, and in our ablations, we found that this performs wildly better. So now digging right, into the results. Do, do, yeah? do you mind if I ask a question just on that, uh, that last slide? Um, uh, sure, yeah. How, how did you, um, why is the maximizing this, uh, the second, the third bullet point, the same as maximizing the joint? Why are they equivalent to each other? Uh, 
Uh, well, you can just you know factorize any probability any joint distribution into um, in this way, and you, you could you could do the reverse factorization as well. Oh, sorry, I didn't even see the log. Yeah, okay, okay, yeah, that makes a lot of oh. sense. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Without the log, that would that wouldn't make sense. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, so digging into the results, the first thing we were interested in is just you know what happens when we train these models in this way. How how do they perform discriminatively? How do they perform generatively? Um, and the first thing we find is that, you know, as a hybrid generative discriminative model, uh, these models perform very well. Um, you, the, they, they retain their very strong accuracy of the discriminative model used with just a slight decrease in accuracy, but also at the same time, obtain generative results that are, or at the time were on, were on par with the state of the art in GANs and score-based models. Uh, and we see this holds across a number of data sets um, you know, from CIFAR 10, CIFAR 100, street view house numbers. And I would say most interestingly, uh, prior work on these hybrid models has found that you basically either have to optimize for one of these two things. If you wanna get stronger generative performance, you, you can only get that at the sacrifice of a very large amount of accuracy. Uh, or if you want stronger discriminative performance, you're gonna take a serious hit to your generative modeling performance. Uh, and we found that our, our models uh, performed very close to the best uh, single purpose models, whether that be discriminative or generative. So uh, now into a, I would say a potentially more interesting result, uh, which is more related to the discriminative applications of these models. Uh, and that's in uh, building more calibrated models. So one thing that's I think been pretty well known is that as deep neural networks have gotten more accurate over the years, they've also gotten significantly less calibrated. And what this means is that the predictive uncertainty doesn't mean as much. Um, <clears throat> like ideally, if our model outputs class one with confidence 0.9, we would like it to be correct 90% of the time. And most neural network classifiers tend to be very overconfident. They tend to output everything with like 99, 100% accuracy, but they still make mistakes. And this is problematic when deploying these models because it doesn't give the end user or the engineer deploying this uh, any ability to make rational choices about whether or not they want to make unconfident predictions, for example. And one thing we find is that by adding this EDM training with GEM, we greatly improve the calibration of our classifiers without significantly hurting accuracy. And unlike other approach, uh, other approaches to improving calibration of these models, ours requires no additional training data. Uh, so we can see here uh, some calibration histograms for our baseline models and our gem models on CIFAR 100. And we can see that, so this is a, a histogram of model confidence to accuracy. So what you'd like to see is a perfect diagonal line here. And we can see that the baseline is very poorly calibrated, uh, wildly overconfidence, but uh, training with GEM leads to uh, much more correctly calibrated models, which downstream would be much more useful to an end user. So the next thing we looked into was out of distribution detection. So, you know, we have this now strong generative model, strong P of X model, uh, but we also have a strong classifier. Uh, so we're able to exploit the P of X model for out of distribution detection, as well as, you know, we could easily apply a number of the other techniques out there based on discriminative models to do this. Um, so what we found is that um, using our likelihood, uh, the you know the energy from our model for out of distribution discrimination uh, was considerably more successful than other types of generative models. Uh, so what we've done here is we've plotted histograms of likelihoods for in distribution and out of distribution data. So in in green, out in red. And we would like the green to be further to the right uh, than the red. And we can see here, uh, looking at GLOW, this is a very common example of the issue I mentioned earlier, where our out of distribution data has much higher likelihood than our in distribution data, meaning that our any, any likelihood based predictor would wildly fail at this. Uh, we also see that on some very different data sets like CIFAR 100 and Celeb A, the likelihood is not particularly useful at discriminating between. Uh, in and out of distribution examples. But then when we compare that from the, with the likelihoods from, from our energy-based models, we find that they are actually much more discriminative. Uh, and we see that we can actually get a, a positive correlation between in and out of distribution data uh, uh, across Street View House numbers, which is 
a notoriously difficult example, um, and even more closely related data sets like CIFAR 100 and CELEB-A. And we were also able to uh, derive a, a, new a new metric for additive distribution detection, which exploits the gradients of the energy function, uh, sort of motivated by typicality. And um, we found that, and that's on the right here, and we found that that led to very strong additive distribution performance. And interestingly, though, our typicality-based score uh, does not work at all when you apply it uh, to other models like flows and VAEs and autoregressive models. So one of the last things we looked into uh, was adversarial robustness. And something we noticed uh, in doing this work is that there's actually a lot of similarities Sorry. between uh, adversarial training. Yeah? But <clears throat> I thought uh, P theta of X was not tractable because you, you cannot normalize it. Did I, did I miss something? Oh, no. So this is, um, but we don't need the normalizing constant to, to score the likelihood of two different points, right? Understood. Thank you. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> But yeah, so we noticed some pretty interesting connections between adversarial training and the approach we use to train our energy-based models. So for adversarial training, we take our input data X and then we perform an optimization procedure to maximize some downstream network activation. So that's misclassification probability for standard adversarial training. And then we optimize the parameters of our model to then minimize this activation at this new point. And when we do the approximate likelihood gradient approach, we're going to generate or optimize via noisy gradient descent, an example which maximizes this downstream network activation here at the energy or the negative energy. Um, and then we're gonna optimize the model to minimize th that exact activation at that data point. So there's a similar flavor here to what we're doing. Uh, and we thought this might explain some prior results on why, um, energy-based models have been shown to be somewhat useful for this. Uh, so we found actually that, that training with GEM leads to notably improved adversarial robustness. So we can see here uh, with respect to in, an increased attack size, um, our baseline models are quite poorly robust. Small attacks will decrease accuracy to, to zero, but training with GEM leads to a notable improvement in robustness. And we also found that we can sort of apply that approach I described earlier using the MCMC sampler of our model. So we can take our potentially off distribution example and then run a few steps of MCMC to get us closer to the data manifold. And then we can classify that example instead. And we found that just applying uh, one step of this, as you see here in green or 10 steps in red, uh, leads to further improvements in adversarial robustness, uh, which we thought was a quite interesting result. And actually this, these robustness results were at the time better than the state of the art adversarial training. And actually, I should say, um, further work has pushed this even further and demonstrated. And actually, I think to still to this day, one of the strongest performing general approaches for robustness is based on energy-based models. So uh, to understand this a little bit, uh, understand why this works, we can generate a different kind of adversarial example where we start from random noise and then we optimize, we backpropagate it to the pixels of an image to generate an image that will be classified confidently as a car with greater than 90% confidence. And so when we do this with a standard uh, baseline confnet, we find that we generate nonsense, but all of these examples are gonna be classified confidently as a car by a standard confnet. And then we can also do the same thing on an adversarially trained model and something different happens. We see that there is something car-like popping up in here, but of course these are nowhere near natural image statistics. Uh, but then when we do the same thing with, with GEM, we find that the, you know, that, that car-like features arise and also the image statistics are much closer to, uh, to the data set. And we believe that this is related to the fact that we are tying the classifier logits directly to the, uh, the, probabil the log probability function of the distribution. Um, so the last thing we looked into uh, in a later work was semi-supervised learning. And uh, in this setting, we can just train our log P of X model whenever we have unlabeled data. And then we can maximize the joint when we have labeled data. Um, and we can see here that this leads to some very nice semi-supervised learning results um, and outperforms a very strong baseline like virtual adversarial training in a number of settings. And uh, the reason you can kind of think about this working 
is that a strong inductive bias that's been worked into a lot of uh, semi-supervised learning methods is that um, the classifier's decision bound, the decision should not change too quickly near the data. So virtual adversarial training is just a way of encouraging smoothness along the, along the data density effectively. But we kind of get that for free here because we've tied our classifiers predictions directly to the log probability of the distribution. So effectively, the classifier is going to be encouraged not to change its, they're not going, yeah, not to have its decision boundary in a region of, uh, in a connected region of high probability. So we find that this encourages the decision boundaries to lie in between our classes. And uh, we found that this, in our initial results, led to some nice results uh, compared to other methods on, on MNIST and uh, Street View House numbers. Um, and in a follow-up work uh, that I'm not gonna discuss here called No MCMC for me, we actually improved these results considerably uh, and got some very strong results on semi-supervised learning for, uh, for tabular data. Um, <clears throat> but so, you know, doing this work for me, this was my first sort of large scale work in the space of energy-based models. And you run, I ran into so many difficulties. I mean, it, it really took me a year of solid work to, to get, develop any intuition about these models. Uh, or any, you know, any having any success in getting them to train, and that's because, you know, if if you have some experience in generative models, all the tools you are normally used to using to build intuition about your models are not available to us, because uh, we can't we can't compute exact likelihoods, so we can't use likelihood to to to, to train or to evaluate our models. Uh, it's very hard to diagnose issues uh, or to understand why something is going wrong because we don't have any good metrics to track our progress. And it's also worth mentioning that this approximate maximum likelihood training procedure is very unstable. Um, the bias can be quite large and the parameters of your sample sampler and your uh, optimization need to be tuned like really perfectly or else no learning is gonna happen. And you know, most popular metrics for evaluating these models are based on things like annealed importance sampling. And that involves MCMC and MCMC, as I'm sure some of you know, is very difficult to work with, very difficult to tune. Um, and so that can complicate things greatly. And, uh, and that, I, I, you know, these difficulties uh, were very, uh, very important in motivating some of my later work on exploring alternative ways to train energy-based models um, and alternative ways to evaluate them uh, to make them potentially easier to work with. Um, so I'll just do a quick thanks to my uh, phenomenal co-authors here, um, and uh, I can move on to the next thing I'll discuss, or if there's questions, I'm happy to take them now. Um, I had one question on uh, mm -hmm. kind of how you managed to gain an intuition for these models in. So like, does, does the latent space have a, a similar structure to VAEs or GANs? And I guess kind of a follow-up related thing is mm -hmm. how dependent is that on the actual choice of the energy function itself as well? Well, so one of the things I, um, in general, that I, I think uh, that I like about energy-based models is that they make the fewest assumptions about the data. And I think this leads to, this can lead when the models are trained properly to, I think, much improved performance. So if you look here at the out of distribution detection results, um, so GLOW is a normalizing flow, right? And so what that does is it takes a Gaussian distribution and warps it through invertible transformation. And when you train flows, you observe things, you observe likely, uh, likelihood distributions like this. And, uh, and so in, that effectively looks like a Gaussian distribution. And this is, uh, and you know that that's kind of what you would, what you would expect by just applying invertible transformations on top of the Gaussian. Uh, but then when you look at the likelihood distribution of samples from the uh, or of the test data on Gem, uh, we we have this interesting sort of three modal structure here. And so we we dug into this, and uh, so what we found is that in CFAR ten. Uh, the the top likelihoods here come from classes that have like the lowest entropy. So up here are you'll see like the cars and like uh, airplanes and stuff and boats. 
And then this middle, this middle uh, class here are sort of the, or this middle mode here, uh, you'll find uh, like the deers and the horses and like birds, which have a, more variation in their backgrounds, but they're also more static. And then in the bottom here, you, you'll have the highest entropy classes, which is like frogs and cats and dogs, which have uh, much fuzzier image statistics. And that's a behavior you would want, right? I mean, you can just imagine like, you know, a simple bimodal distribution where one has a smaller variance than the others. Uh, so you would, you would expect to see this, this variability or multimodality in the likelihoods uh, of your samples. And that is not something that flows or in VIEs even have a similar thing because you are warping a Gaussian. Um, <clears throat> And this is something I've seen in uh, multiple works on energy-based models uh, where they can much more easily capture this kind of uncertainty, um, which is one of the things that I think is very appealing about them. Thanks. Does the same thing kind of apply to the work you were saying on proteins and like molecular data structures as well? Or is this more for, for imaging so far that you've noticed that this is the case? Um, so, so I, I can't speak confidently on that because I have not, um, I have not investigated those those properties of these models. Um, I would expect it to to hold across a wide variety of domains, though. But I but I'd say these types of results in the literature have only been, to my knowledge, only been published for things like images, because that's mostly what you know what people publish on. Great, thank you. Yeah, okay. of course. So uh, we also there's a question in the chat. So maybe we'll just okay. go for this one and then we we'll go for the second part of in the interest okay. of time. Okay. So even ask, um, thanks for the insightful talk. So in your experience with training EBMs, which training tricks usually makes the biggest difference? That's um, uh, that's a good question. Um, well, I see the most, the biggest one. Um, if I can get to, uh, try to find my slide on Longevin. Um, yeah, so the biggest one that's very crucial at large scale, uh, as you can see here, when training um, this, you know, when doing the launch of sampling, uh, we have like a step size, which is the hyperparameter of the sampler. And uh, you can see that the step size is related to the amount of noise we add. Uh, basically, it's, you know, you take the square root divided by two, uh, or yeah, multiply by two square root, that gives you the standard, the, the variance of your Gaussian. And uh, one thing that's absolutely crucial at large scale is to basically decouple these two things. So it's, so you end up with more of a two parameter sampler, which has a step size and then a separate amount of noise added. And you can, you can sort of think of that as tempering your sampler. Uh, and the sort of unintuitive thing is that the, the temperatures that you need to use are pretty crazy. You basically need to upweight the gradient by like 20,000 um, to, to actually have decent training. And uh, so like typical parameters people use are setting the step size to be one or like 10 or hundred. And then the amount of uh, the standard deviation of the Gaussian noise is like 0 0.01. And that's for like image data. And that's one of the reasons why most of the large scale work you see these days on EBMs is focused on images because this people figured out good, good uh, hyperparameters for the sampler on images. Uh, but those don't work on other types of data like tabular data, which is something I've addressed in some of my work. Um, I'd say other things that people do. Um, so one thing, what, one common failure mode of training these methods is that uh, if your learning rate is too high, because you can sort of think of this training objective um, when you implement it, uh, you're basically trying to maximize the the likelihood of your data and minimize the likelihood of your samples. And so if you're training too fast, uh, something that happens is that the likelihood of your samples just shoots down and ex like explodes to negative infinity and that leads to divergence. So there's been a couple of, uh, so people commonly add like an L2 regularizer on, on the energy values to keep them uh, more constrained to a, um, to a reasonable range. And I'd say the one last thing that I found works is instead of that, you can actually just penalize the gradient of the energy evaluated at uh, the data, uh, which is which does uh, well, it makes the gradient signal a little bit richer for the sampler uh, and keeps your samples having high likelihood. 
uh, but it also, um, uh, and it can, yeah, it can, it can just somewhat simplify things. So, so regularizers on the energy or its gradients are useful and tempering the samplers, I'd say, are the, kind of the, the most important ones that people use these days. Okay, and great. I, and I so would let's um, go for the uh, second part. Great. And, uh, and I would refer you to a very great work from UCLA uh, called On the Anatomy of MCMC-Based Training of Energy-Based Models, uh, where it's a very great empirical work where they dig into a lot of these issues. Uh, <clears throat> but yeah, okay, so the next thing I'll talk about is uh, my most recent work, or my most recent published work uh, called Oops, I Took a Gradient, Scalable Sampling for Discrete Distributions. Uh, again, joint work with fellows at uh, the University of Toronto and Google Brain. And so, as I've said many times, um, there's been a lot of recent success in EBMs, and most of it comes from using a deep neural network for the energy function. And it, we use Longevin sampling uh, when our data is continuous. Um, <clears throat> but also, basically, every approach out there that's been successful for training EBMs relies on having continuous data. So, score matching methods require gradients, flow contrast of estimation, uh, any sort of variational generator-based methods, they all, they all require continuous data. And that's problematic because there's a lot of discrete data out there. And there's a lot of different types of data that, that is discrete that we would like to apply these types of models to because energy-based models have all these interesting, unique, and powerful properties that would be great if we could apply them to discrete inputs. And I'll get into a, a very common application soon. Uh, but yeah, things like text, tabular data, protein sequences, graph structure data, all of this has discrete structure that we can't just throw away because it's very important to how the, you know, how the data works. And so, <clears throat> so and this was kind of the problem we were trying to address because I would like these models to be a useful class, uh, you know, of models that are easy for people to apply to whatever, dom you know, data domains they have. And so if you can't apply them at all to half of the data that's out there, that is a big issue. Uh, so the most successful method for training EBMs, as I've mentioned, is based on MCMC sampling. And so we thought, well, MCMC sampling in discrete spaces is very difficult because we can't use gradient accelerated samplers like Longevin or HMC. So we thought if we could address that general problem of MCMC in discrete spaces, uh, then that would very immediately enable us to apply all of these techniques and tricks that we've learned on how to train EBMs with continuous data and apply them in, into the discrete space. So that's exactly the, the specific application we're focused on here. So we present a new MCMC sampler for discrete distributions. It, it exploits a very common structure that you'd find in a lot of discrete energy functions um, that, and it can be applied very, very widely. And we find this increases the efficiency of MCMC sampling in discrete spaces. And key to my interest, enables us to train deep energy-based models on discrete data. So digging into the problem specifically, we're interested in sampling from discrete probability distributions, where, which are unnormalized. And we're gonna restrict our study here to binary or categorical data as most uh, finite dimensional discrete spaces can be uh, fit into that. And so probably the most popular, common, and simple approach for sampling discrete probability distributions is Gibbs sampling. And so the way this works is we pick some dimension and then we resample that dimension uh, with all other dimensions held fixed. So if we consider this one here, uh, what we do is we evaluate the likelihood uh, of the distribution at the sample, and then we flip the bit at that location, uh, and then we reevaluate the likelihood. And then we accept this flipped version with uh, basically a probability that's the sigmoid of the difference of the probabilities of before and after we flipped it. Uh, of course, we need to do this now to all of our dimensions if we want to ensure that we, you know, we can explore every single element of the state space. And so typically people just fix some ordering of the dimensions and just repeat through this over and over again. This is called raster scan Gibbs sampling. But if we can think of, you know, in this sort of MNIST example, uh, some dimensions might not make much sense to try to flip. Uh, so we see here, this image, most of the pixels are black. So if we pick a black pixel and we propose to change it, the likelihood is gonna be a lot lower 
if we're if we change it to be white and we're never going to accept that transition and we've just wasted all of the all of the computation that we that we've done to you know to achieve no result um, also so if we propose a digit to change that's in the middle of uh, of some digit here that's also not going to change because the likelihood that that becomes black very 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 low so we can you know thinking more intuitively about this specific example the dimensions on the edge of the character are probably the ones that are most likely to be accepted if we if we flip them because this distribution has you know some smoothness in that direction uh, and so I ran some experiments on models trained on MNIST, and what you find is that when you do a raster scan, only about two percent of the variables change when you uh, when you apply this. So what that effectively means is that you're wasting ninety eight percent of your computation, which is a large percentage of your computation. But it gets a little bit more uh, a little bit more complicated than that because it's not as simple as determining which dimensions in your input are going to be the right ones to change because the right ones to change might also depend on your current example. So we can see here, the pixels on the edge of this four are very different than the pixels on the edge of this one. So if we'd like to improve Gibbs sampling, we would want to choose which pixels to propose to change, but that is gonna need to be a function of the entire input. And so what we propose to do here is we're going to sample the pixel that we'd like to change from some proposal distribution. And we're, we're gonna want this proposal to be conditioned on the input because of the uh, feature I just mentioned. And so to generate a new sample, we're gonna sample a dimension from our proposal over pixels. And then we're going to propose a new sample by flipping the bit at that dimension. And then since we've added this stochastic proposal, uh, we need to add a Metropolis Hastings correction step here. Um, so we accept this with this probability now, which is slightly different than what we would do for standard Gibbs. So <clears throat> now the question that we're left with is how do we design this proposal distribution? Uh, <clears throat> and so in continuous spaces, you would never want to optimize your MCMC sampler to maximize acceptance probability because uh, for HMC, for example, you're just gonna make your, your step size go to zero and then you're never gonna change anything. Um, but in discrete spaces, the minimum, you know, there, there is a fixed minimum amount that we can move, which is, you know, a Hamming distance of one. So in this case, and actually the maximum we could ever move for a Gibbs step also has a Hamming distance of one. So actually, so we, it's actually fine for us to try to optimize the acceptance probability. And when we think about doing that, there's sort of two terms in this probability here for Metropolis Hastings that we'd want to consider optimizing. So the first is this likelihood difference between uh, our proposed sample and our previous sample. And we'll want this to be large uh, to encourage this part of the probability to be large. Uh, and basically this would mean only proposing examples that have very high likelihood. But the other term here, uh, this sort of likelihood ratio of forward and backward proposals, uh, this kind of has the opposite incentive. And this is going to encourage our proposal distribution to have high entropy. So we want to make sure that we can, you know, that we're picking a large variety of points and not just the one that has the highest likelihood. And so these two are kind of at odds with one another, and we need to balance them properly to enable efficient sampling. So one idea for this would be to let the probability of selecting a dimension be proportional to the amount that the likelihood increases or decreases if we flip that dimension. And so what this looks like is basically just a, a tempered softmax over every single dimension where the logit value is the amount that the probability increases and then scaled by some temperature. And so, the reason why this uh, is, a, is a very interesting um, uh, and useful proposal is that we see here, if by plugging this in, uh, if we set the temperature of this softmax to two, then the most complicated and high variance terms cancel out. And then we're just left with this ratio of the normalizing constants of those softmaxes. And if we make some assumptions that are energy function is 
relatively smooth, so changing one pixel doesn't affect it too much, then we're going to find that this ratio is going to be very close to one, leading us to almost always accept our proposed transitions. And it's been shown in some great work from a guy named Giacomo Zanella that proposals like this are actually near optimal over all proposals that make local moves uh, for discrete MCMC. And so <clears throat> now thinking a bit about the computational considerations here. So we have this optimal proposal for our discrete sampling where the probability we select an example is based on the, prob the probability change in our distribution from the current value to changing that pixel. And if we wanted to compute this for a d-dimensional input, we would need to evaluate our likelihood function d times or d plus one times. And if d is large here, like say in images or the kind of data that we're interested in in machine learning today, we need to evaluate this function a lot of times. And if our function is something like say a deep neural network that's not super cheap to evaluate, then this is not gonna lead to a very efficient MCMC sampling method. So with that in mind, um, <clears throat> we you know, just looked at a wide array of discrete distributions, you know, from some simple discrete distributions to some classical EBMs from, from the physics and biology community to restricted Boltzmann machines, to hidden Markov models, to deep models. And these all have a wide variety of different structures, different applications, different types of data. But there's one thing we noticed that was really common uh, was that the way that they're often or most commonly implemented is as a continuous differentiable function that accepts real valued inputs. But the discrete structure in these distributions comes by restricting those inputs to a discrete subset of the possible values. So looking at the Ising model here, this energy function, xtwx plus bx, x could be any real value, that's continuous. But the way we implement this in practice is we restrict x to be plus or minus one. <clears throat> and that's common for just about how every one of these distributions is implemented. And so what we do is we just take the, we do the simplest thing possible. We, we take a Taylor, we use a Taylor series to estimate the values of flipping each bit from our current location, just a first order Taylor series. And we find that uh, for binary data, we can in parallel using only one call to our functions gradients uh, we can estimate the probability of flipping every single bit in parallel in just one call to the gradient. And we can come up with a similar expression uh, for categorical data that's just as easy to compute. And so we've gone from D evaluations to one. So that's a nice improvement for us in high dimensions. And so that's basically wrap, wraps up the approach, which we call Gibbs with gradients. Um, <clears throat> And so it's a new sampler for discrete distributions. So it's a metropolis hasting sampler where we have a proposal function, a proposal distribution over dimensions that we're gonna to propose to flip in our input. The proposal that we use approximates the optimal locally balanced proposal that you see here. We approximate it using a Taylor series uh, evaluated on the, uh, con the sort of continuous interpretation of this discrete distribution's energy function. And so now we can, we can proceed with our sampler, considering all dimensions, but only doing uh, one call to our likelihood functions gradient. And so this is a simple and efficient sampler. And most important to me is that it has no hyperparameters that we need to tune, uh, which if any of you have worked with MCMC extensively, that's the, that's the, that's the holy grail of, of MCMC. Um, so looking at this visually, um, so what we have here is we have some discrete target distribution. We're trying to move this ball around this lattice. But this distribution, just like many important realistic distributions that you'll work with, is actually defined by some underlying continuous function that we discretize to come up with the energy values. So what we do here is we push down into this continuous representation uh, we use a Taylor series to estimate the likelihood values at nearby discrete points. We use those to uh, parameterize a proposal over local discrete moves. We sample from this proposal, apply Metropolis Hastings correction, and that's how we advance our sample. Uh, in code, it's very easy to implement. 
I think the PyTorch implementation, this is even shorter. So, and just standard auto diff methods and probability libraries will enable you to implement this in no more than 10 lines of code. Uh, and we find that, you know, compared to say Gibbs sampling or other uh, competitive discrete samplers, Gibbs with gradients leads to notably faster convergence um, <clears throat> and also just considerably less computation used. So here we're sampling from an RBM that I pre-trained using contrastive divergence. Um, and uh, here we have uh, sampling from an Ising model for um, image denoising, which is a uh, older school computer vision technique. Um, and again, here, this is a, a data set with a, a hundred by hundred images. So this is a 10,000 variables. So that's a pretty high dimensional discrete distribution. Um, so now getting into the stuff that I was really motivated by um, is using this to train energy-based models. So we can recall that we can estimate the gradient of the likelihood using MCMC sampling to estimate this expectation here. So better, more efficient MCMC leads to less biased sample, a less biased likelihood a gradient computation leading to better training. Um, so I can I'll quickly dig into uh, two of our uh, two of our experiments here. Uh, first is on contact prediction for proteins using POTS models, and the next is deep energy based models for discrete images. So. Uh, protein contact prediction is a very big problem in computational biology. Uh, basically, you'd like to learn from a sequence of amino acids which amino acids are going to be in contact when that protein folds. And you can recover this actually by looking at the correlations in the data between uh, the amino acid pairs. And so what's commonly done is we train a POTS model, which is sort of like a categorical extension of the Ising model. And its energy function here uh, has two parts. First, they're sort of like single site uh, terms. And then we have pairwise terms, which basically uh, score how each pair of amino acids interacts. And so the cool thing about this model is that the only way it can model the likelihood is through those pairwise or single site interactions. So what we do is we train a POTS model and we take a look at the uh, the strength of these interactions kind of viewed in a matrix. And then we can look at the, the, the small values that are near zero and we can predict that there's no contact. And we can look at the large values and predict that there is a contact. And this is a, a very commonly used technique uh, in computational biology today. But the POTS model is unnormalized so we can't train it to maximize likelihood. So typically people use uh, pseudo likelihood, which is a weaker estimator of the parameters of the model. Uh, so at the high level, what we find is that Gibbs with gradients uh, greatly outperforms pseudo likelihood maximization uh, and also outperforms Gibbs sampling uh, for downstream contact prediction accuracy. Uh, and this is the case on a smaller protein. And you can see both of the maximum likelihood approaches outperform pseudo likelihood. But on this much larger protein, Gibbs sampling degrades in performance worse than pseudo likelihood, but Gibbs with gradients outperforms. Uh, and this could potentially enable uh, this type of technique to be applied to much larger proteins than it's been previously uh, applied to in the past. So the last thing I'll dig into um, is that I mentioned all the recent success with DPBMs comes from using a deep neural network for the energy function. So, but that's not been possible before because we could not efficiently do the sampling. Uh, so here we train a ResNet M, um, energy-based model on binary and categorical image data. So for the binary values, the pixels are zero or one. And for the categorical va uh, values, uh, each pixel is a one of 256 way softmax. And so thinking about this computationally, if we wanted to do one step of Gibbs sampling, we would need to evaluate the the energy function 256 times. And that only allows us to change one pixel in the image. So it's 256 times the number of dimensions more efficient for our, for our model. So this is like something you would never even consider being able to train uh, using Gibbs sampling. And so what we found was that uh, we trained a number of models on binary and categorical images and evaluated with annealed important sampling. 
And uh, we were able to outperform variational autoencoders on these examples um, on almost all of our data sets. And we also greatly outperform alternative or prior energy-based models and considerably outperform training our same exact models using GIB sampling with a comparable or with the same computation budget. Uh, it goes from pretty crappy results to pretty nice results. And GIB sampling was completely not possible on the categorical images because it, it literally is like 20,000 times more efficient to use Gibbs with gradients. Um, and, you know, there's some samples from our models. They look pretty good, yeah, but it's, you know, small stuff. So uh, I don't look into it too much. Um, but yeah, so, you know, I'd refer you to our paper for some additional results on uh, energy-based models of text. Also like doing uh, structural inference in Ising models and uh, some additional experiments uh, on just evaluating the MCMC sampler on its own. Um, but yeah, so you know, I think there's a lot of directions where this work can go. I think uh, specific improvements for very large categoricals could be useful for sampling from text models. Um, I also think that we could utilize some of these insights for discrete optimization. Uh, but also I think we could use the same types of ideas to generalize uh, other types of discrete model training methods. Uh, and actually this was, a, I think there was an iClear paper where they, they, uh, in, they took our sort of gradient based insight in our proposal distribution and they used that to do ratio matching much more efficiently. And also there was a follow-up work to this, um, well, a, a, an extension pr uh, published at, uh, at iClear, I think this past year, where they uh, basically showed that by just re resampling from the proposal multiple times before the metropolis hasting step uh, leads to even more efficiency gains in sampling. Uh, so I think this work has, yeah, it's seen an, uh, a fair bit of, of application uh, since, it's, since it's been published. But yeah, so I'll just say thanks again to my co-authors and thanks again to everybody here for coming. Um, happy to take a couple questions. I know I think I went a little bit over time, so I don't want to don't want to uh, keep you guys here if you got to run. But if yeah, there are worry. questions, I'm I think happy to that we around. started a little bit late uh, after uh, three, so yeah, yeah, kind of just on time. So uh, thank right. everyone for attending. So I mean, yeah, feel free to leave, but you can definitely also ask questions if you have any. Yeah, this was um, a, yeah. I had a sorry. Were you going to say something? Oh, I was just going to say that this um, this is like one of my favorite works I've ever done because. The method was like when, when we came up with this, we we were almost certain that it was like too stupid that somebody had, had to have done it. And uh, but then upon further inspection, I think it was maybe too stupid that nobody thought it was worth doing. So uh, and I think that's like that's I think the at least in my career, that's the, the sweet spot you want to be. You want to have a very simple method that's really easy to implement, really easy to use and works well. And I feel like we got very lucky in in, in that with this one. But yes, yeah, so you had a question. Yeah, no, I just want to say I really enjoyed that talk. It was super interesting. Um, Thank you. And uh, the the one I wanted to come back to was that really lovely figure that you had, which I think was the uh, like showing the map between the four distributions or something like that. There was one little bit that I didn't quite understand, which was in the this guy. Yeah, that one. The going from the second um, image to the the third. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I don't get in why the X has the arrows coming out of it like what what are those meant to be representing so does each data point have gradients in different directions to then get mapped um yeah okay so um so you're talking about this this part here yeah yeah, yeah exactly yeah um yeah so well like so if we're at this point here x right the only other the only places we can move to are the are the you know places within handling distance one so that that would be here 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 and here so we just do a Taylor series of approximation of the likelihood here, 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 and here uh, using the gradients. And so it's basically just, you know, in this simple two-dimensional example, we take the gradients and then we project it onto each of these uh, vectors going out in each direction. And then that gives us, um, you know, gives us a, um, uh, an estimate for the probability there. Got you. Okay. Does that make okay. sense? Yeah, I, I, I think so. I guess the thing that's confusing me is like how you managed to still go in like one direction, considering that you're now in a continuous distribution. Maybe that doesn't really make sense as a question, but I, yeah, I, I that, that's the one thing that doesn't. Well, like, you. 
Yeah. I mean, so like, you know, with the Taylor series, right. Um, you're approximating so the value of some function at some point nearby to another point. Right. So here's the, you know, here's our starting point. And then we can choose the values that we want to, um, that we want to approximate this function at. Right. So, so, and those we pick to be everything, all discrete points that are hamming distance one away from our current point. And that's okay. how we, yeah. Yeah, so this no, is just okay, an no, attempt no. to visualize what happens when you take this gradient and then sort of project it down onto this axis and this axis. It really is quite a nice figure as well. I feel like this is this Thank is a thing. I don't know if uh, if you said that your um your supervisor, I think David uh, uh, Duvernon, and I noticed yeah. the same thing with like the really clear figure ones as well. Like they they look That's great. the most probably the most valuable thing he taught me is that um well you know communication is wildly important in this field. Uh, people like pretty pictures. Uh, and they, they help. And uh, I feel like the, the joke I always say about Dave is that uh, when he does research, the first thing he does is the tweet about the paper, then, then figure one, then the title, and then he does the research. <laughs> and uh, I found it's a useful technique, a place to start. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's definitely working for me. It's definitely working for me. Thank you. Thank you again. Yeah. No okay, problem. great. So we also there's a question in the chat. So even ask, okay. okay, so thank you for the talk. Do you have a go-to method for evaluating you know, whether your EBN hyperparameters are good or not uh, without having to measure downstream task performance? <sighs> yeah, that's tricky. Um, so there is, so yeah, for, for, for training energy-based models, um, a useful, a, a useful heuristic for figuring out if things are working um, is looking at the relative energy values uh, in training. So like, so you have the energy values of your data and the energy values of your samples from MCMC. And uh, what, you, what you would expect, and this is all very hand wavy, but this is how people do it. Um, you, one way to, to, to know that things are working out is that you'll often see, uh, you'll want the sort of the average of this, uh, of the difference between the real and the, and the generated examples um, to not be too big, not be too small. So you'll want that to be in a healthy range. I'd say, you know, for like image data, you'll want that to be no bigger than like a couple hundred. Uh, and then you also want to see some variability in it. You'll want to see it go above and below zero because what can happen you kind of get into these runaway dynamic situations where if your models, if your, if your model is assigning routinely higher likelihood to the, uh, to the training data than to the samples from your model, uh, then you sort of end up seeing this sort of divergence where the likelihood of your models gets really, of your data gets really high, the likelihood of your samples gets really low. And it's basically like the, uh, the optimizer sort of the, yeah, the optimizer overtakes the sampler. And uh, so one way you can diagnose this is by looking at those differences in probabilities. And if, if they're not too huge and bounce above and below zero, that usually means things are going well. Yeah. Um, trying to think okay. of other stuff that, that people have used in the past. Um, yeah, I mean, just you know, looking at the relative differences of the energy values on training and test data is also useful. Um, you know, it doesn't tell you much about the likelihood of the models, but it does tell you um, if you know if if your if your model is assigning wildly different values uh, to your training and test data, uh, that usually is a good indication that uh, some that you know some sort of divergence is happening, um, whether that is you know just overfitting or your you know uh, many of the optimization issues that I mentioned. Okay, thanks a lot. So I guess uh, I, can, I will just uh, ask you a uh, very high level question just to, uh, to end this talk. Okay, so um, mm -hmm. maybe you remember like last year's EBN's uh, workshop that in the panel session mm -hmm. that, you know, uh, our conversation together with mm -hmm. Yana Kun about discussing the difficulties on training EBN's, right? And uh, Yana Kun is basically saying that forget about the normalizing constant. Don't treat it as, yeah. as say, uh, probability models, right? Where I talk a lot, lot about probability things. So um, I would like to hear about, say, your comments here, because many of the things that you're trying to address here is definitely related to this, you know, uh, normalizing constant, right? In fact, I would say that yeah. if you ignore that uh, 
thing, then um, you don't even need to say work on say uh, this gives with radiant, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's interesting. And you know, I definitely came, came. You know, my interest in energy based models comes from probabilistic modeling and learning probably you know accurate probability models for high dimensional data. Um, and yeah, so I, you know, I think that was interesting because I guess in, you know, in computer vision applications and stuff, um, uh, yeah, e EBMs have a, yeah, they, I guess they have a sort of a, sort of a more, a more broad um, use case where um, like in structured, structured output prediction and things like that, a uh, common way to do that is to parameterize some energy function and then just minimize it. Um, and that is, you know, so if you're, and there's ways to like sort of use like um, implicit gradients and stuff to, to backprop through this optimization. And, and then, yeah, really, it doesn't really matter uh, the, uh, doesn't really matter the, uh, the probabilistic interpretation of it. It's just a more powerful function approximator. Um, so, well, actually, so, so I, I will say at that time, at that time, I was less interested in um, in those kind of methods because I didn't really see them as probabilistic methods or I didn't really see them as useful for the types of applications that I'm interested in these models for. Um, but there's been some, you know, I think that if you think about how these, these EBMs are trained, nowadays, like I mentioned, you crank up the step size of the sampler and you tune down the noise. So like, they were kind of just doing optimization. And, and there's been some interesting work in this space recently. Um, highly recommend looking at a guy named Yilan Du's work um, where he's kind of pushed, he's kind of said, let's ignore sampling. Let's just train these models to reconstruct our inputs uh, at where we have some energy function and we just generate an, an image to minimize the energy. And then we just do L2 reconstruction laws, very similar to like a VAE. Uh, but the cool thing there is that you get, you can do all these nice, uh, you can bake in a lot of this nice structure uh, that EBMs give you that a VAE couldn't do. And he's shown you can learn very cool like representations in an unsupervised way, um, uh, like sort of product models of like that can unsupervised disentangle objects or facial features. Um, and he's been able to scale that because he's completely ignored the probabilistic interpretation of these models. Um, and so I, I, so I, I do think that that is a very, you know, there's a lot of potential to go in that direction. Um, uh, you know, I think, you know, things like MCMC are always going to be important because, you know, and, you know, in various science applications and Bayesian modeling and stuff like that. So it, I still think that's a very interesting direction to go. And I would love to, you know, what my, like, one of my dreams is to make these models just less hacky and better to easier to work with, but. But I, I do think it's I, I do think there's a lot of possibility out there that um, that maybe the right approach to energy based models is to just think of it as optimization. So I, I will say I've turned I've uh, turned a corner on that one a little bit. Yeah. OK, great. So here, I guess this really depends on which application you are going to apply yeah. and which application probability are really important or not. Right. Yes, exactly. Okay. Great. Thanks a lot. So thanks again, Will, for uh, joining us. And I hope that everyone in the talk definitely uh, enjoyed your um, talk and I definitely see quite a lot of chats saying that thanks for your talk. And also thanks everyone awesome. for coming. So uh, I will also, you know, share your other talks and you know, just watch your uh, mailing list. But yeah, so <laughs> right now we just uh, close the talk and thanks everyone. All right. Thank you so much.